Good morning and welcome. Uh, thank you all so much for coming here. Uh, we are very pleased and proud to have you here. Um, I trust you all are well. <laughs> um, again, thank you all for coming. My name is Colin Stearns. I'm an assistant professor of photography here at Parsons School for Design. Um, as an image maker and as a teacher, I couldn't be more proud and excited to be a co-member, a co-host of this event. Um, the, um, I, sorry, forget my notes here. The Photography Expanded Symposium presented by the Magnum Foundation. Um, today's symposium, Counter Histories, so perfectly binds the mission of the New School, the Magnum Foundation, and Parsons um, in this moment in, an, in education and social engagement. Uh, here at Parsons, I'm also the program director for the BFA in photography. Our photography program is committed to a social engagement via visual philosophies through fashion photography, commercial photography, editorial, and visual art. Um, before I kick off the event, I want to hand out a couple of thank yous. Obviously, thank you to the Magnum Foundation for reaching out to us and wanting to partner with us. Ninth Degree for helping host and put this event together. This symposium wouldn't happen without the hard work by Iris Stevens, our program administrator. Thank you, Iris Stevens. And I also want to thank Jamer Hunt from the Provost Office, who over many years of stewardship of this program has handed it off to us. Thank you so much. And now I uh, introduce Kristen Lubbin. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like um, we're working hard in our own offices and our own spaces and opportunities like this are a chance to get um, the extended family of thinkers and makers together. So it's wonderful to see you all here today. And thank you um, to Colin and the New School for hosting us for our fifth Photography Expanded Symposium, which explores counter histories and alternative narratives in new photography. Hello also to our live stream audience and happy International Workers' Day. <laughs> yes, perfect timing for a conversation like today's, as well as apparently the beginning of spring, finally, at long last. My name is Kristen Lubbin, and I'm the executive director of the Magnum Foundation. We're a nonprofit organization that supports new voices and new approaches in documentary photography. Through training, mentorship, project support, and by creating spaces like this one in which we can exchange ideas and challenge one another to expand the parameters of socially engaged visual storytelling. I'd like to thank the incredible staff and board of the Magnum Foundation. And could you stand up, Magnum Foundation staff? and board while you're at it, so we can give you a round of applause. This team is incredible and works so hard, um, and we're also able to do the work that we do because of an extended network of partners like those we have here at the New School. Um, we're also incredibly grateful for the funders and supporters who make our work possible, both individuals and foundations, some of whom are here today, particularly the Open Society Foundation um, and the Fledgling Fund. Um, Photography Expanded is Magnum Foundation's initiative to explore new modes of visual storytelling to foster opportunities for collaboration and experimentation through labs, workshops, and this annual symposium. This year, we've focused on the concept of counter histories, which is um, as Colin mentioned, a particularly timely concept to be um, engaging with. Um, at this moment, which is either a meltdown or an inflection point, depending at which time of day you read the news um, or think about it, we're seeing histories reactivated and reemployed both as political dog whistles to animate and underscore ideologies, but at the same time, we're seeing other histories that have been long suppressed, re-examined, resurfacing, and put to work in ways that allow us to write new histories and necessary stories about the past and imagine different futures for ourselves. And those are the projects that we'll be looking at today. Today's presenters experiment with many different approaches to storytelling, augmented reality, research, poetry, performance, archiving, and um, wet plate photography. Thomas, I'm, I'm talking about you. 
um, and demonstrate that some of the most inventive work that hap is happening at the outer limits of what we'd call photography. And our hope with this day is that these presentations will inspire and encourage you in your own practice, whatever that might be, to experiment and engage um, in, this, in this process as well. And um, I'd like to share with you before we start a couple of the images that have been on my mind as we developed this theme. And there are so many others that um, I could have included and many that were also brought to our attention by our extensive um, working group that helped us plan for this day and brought many great ideas to the table. But there are just a few in addition to today's speakers that were on my mind that I wanted to share with you. The first being um, Susan Mycellus' Kurdistan, first published as a book in 1996, which has been referred to as a national archive for a stateless people, so a, a traveling national archive that's portable um, but brings together this history over 100 years of photographic history of the Kurds, um, really a landmark project that's looking at assembling um, a, a previously unassembled history. Um, another one that I've been fascinated with lately is Laya Abril's On Abortion, a book which just came out recently. Um, she titles it um, Episode One in the History of Misogyny, so it's conceived as part of a series, um, and the history of abortion and, and the lack of access to reproductive health care is, in her mind, Chapter One in a History of misogyny. And what she does with this project that I think is so interesting is that she calls attention to the fact that photography can be a problematic medium for dealing with suppressed histories because for a photograph to have been taken, for an archive to have been made, somebody has to have decided that this is a subject worthy of recording. And there are many histories that we need to think about um, that weren't photographed because they were either too shameful or too repressed or um, illegal to be recorded. And so she finds amazing and inventive ways of um, describing this history and describing the effects on the uh, 47,000 women who die every year due to illegal abortions and the long history of that. So um, a project that's worth checking out. Another one also um, a sort of creative engagement with the archive is Zoe Leonard's Faye Richards photo archive, which she created for Cheryl Denny's Watermelon Woman. And this, too, is essentially a fabricated archive, uh, an imaginary archive that she created um, of this black lesbian um, actress. And it stands in for all so many archives that we know don't exist, things that weren't passed down to us. But we know these people existed, and we know their stories exist. So what are we leaving out when we only draw on official archives and official records? Sometimes we need to be creative about filling in the gaps. Um, speaking of gaps, <laughs> this is um, from Ed Clark's Negative Publicity, um, which just came down as an exhibition at ICP, I believe, and was also a book that was co-produced by the Magnum Foundation and the Aperture Foundation, where he's bringing together um, images from the global war on terror and particularly US government enhanced interrogation techniques um, and extraordinary rendition. So you see these incredibly heavily redacted documents. Um, and again, one has to imagine what's behind those, what stands behind them, and what photography can't image. Another incredible um, series that came to mind for me was Nona Faustine Simmons' White Shoes, where she photographs herself, not photoshopped, she actually took these photographs, um, on the sites of historical slave auctions in New York City. So she's placing her own body on these sites and calling attention to the violent histories that are embedded in the streets around us, the streets that we walk through in New York City. Um, and then another one that's been on my mind, this is a photograph that Susan emailed to me um, and a few others in this room last week when she was in Montgomery for the opening of the new monument um, to Americans who were killed by lynching. And it's just such an extraordinary example, even though it's not um, primarily photographic, of some of the themes that we'll be talking about today. Um, and particularly the way in which this monument 
reframes the history of lynching as not an isolated historical time period in this country's history, but instead as part of a continuum that begins with slavery and um, continues today in the form of mass incarceration. So the way that a visual experience, that a cultural monument, an artwork can reframe a history and reposition it to allow space for memory, for mourning, and hopefully for mobilization. The ideas that we are sharing today were also informed um, by a production lab that we held last month at Columbia University's Brown Center for Media Innovation. Um, this lab was held by uh, an open call where we asked for proposals on the theme of counter histories and alternative narratives and for applications from image makers who are interested in experimenting with new technologies, new platforms, particularly augmented reality, locative media. Um, and it turns out that these media are incredibly well suited to this theme of counter histories because they enable you to layer multiple histories. They enable you to create work that is specific to the site that you're in. And you'll see some of those later today. Um, and you'll hear um, more from some of the participants in that lab um, and from my colleague Emma Raines um, later today in a panel uh, that includes some of the participants. Um, and you can also read more about the lab and its participants um, on the Magnum Foundation website. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to share with you a very short video um, that our wonderful spring Magnum Foundation fellow, Meng Wen Sao, created about the lab. project is about the legacies of radical activism in families, specifically my own. So I'm doing a project about my dad, who was a weatherman. It was part of a radical leftist group in the 70s. I've been photographing the various archives, so this government archive, which is an FBI file, along with my parents' personal archive of propaganda and posters and flyers. My project Las Carpetas is a compendium of surveillance and trauma, both observed and lived in Puerto Rico. It appropriates sort of a newly discovered photographic archive of the, the, the Puerto Rican secret police. This project exemplifies this idea that it's not the actual content of the surveillance that matters, it's the fact that it's happening and what chilling effect that has on civil society. The drug war started in 2006 and 2017 was actually in Mexico's most violent year on record. At the same time, 2018 is on track to top that. So it's really important to look at the toll of the drug war right now. My project is about documenting the, uh, and mapping clandestine graves across Mexico. I grew up in the Smith Houses, and uh, from the time that I was about 19 uh, through the time that I turned 22, maybe a little bit longer, I was the vice president of the resident association there. Um, so I worked really closely with residents to create programming and sort of be like a liaison between elected officials and residents. And since moving to Harlem, I wanted to create a project that goes back to where I'm from and, and really explores that history. I'm mostly interested in finding family album portraits taken from the time that the development was first open, right after World War II, to present days. My project, Blue Celia Copywriting Light of Day, is in reaction to pending copyright legislation number 2517D 2015 which, if passed, would retroactively erase the entire photographic archives of the Argentinian dictatorship, um, which my family experienced. My project is essentially in reaction to the legislation and is attempting to alter the images just enough so I can personally recopyright them and then donate them back into the public domain after the legislation is passed. So I'm making an archive that is both saved by the law and safe from the law. I'm working on a project that will place the documentation of a history of student uprisings inside of some of the schools where the uprisings took place. 
So my project is taking a look at photo albums that have been maintained by labor unions in the United States in the latter part of the 20th century. Following the, the 2016 election, you know, there, we're left with this question of when we hear Make America Great Again, who was it great for and when was it great? I came here today to a workshop here to stay, which is a placekeeping project that hopefully will map the changing Chinatown community and identify places of meaning within the community. We've always hoped that the brigade as a collective could be a model for cultural organizations that are working closely with community groups to fight for social change. And um, I think that we haven't really allowed ourselves to imagine what we could be like in the future and how we could really make the best use of the technology that's available. Um, and again, you'll be hearing from some of the other participants later in the day um, about that lab. Um, but now I would like to start off with our first speaker, Laura Wexler. Laura is a professor of American Studies and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Yale. She founded and directs the Photographic Memory Workshop at Yale and is one of the leading scholars of photography, memory, and archives, and their intersections with race, gender, and class. She's currently working on a collection of her essays entitled The Look, the Gaze, and the Relay Race, Photography and Everyday Memory. She has many books, but I liked the title of that one, so I felt like I needed to say that. Today, she will be talking about Frederick Douglass and how his proposals for photography could have set the young medium on a different path. Laura Wexler, thank you so much for being with us. Okay, well, um, good morning, and I, I just want to reiterate my thanks to Kristen Lubin and uh, Magnum Foundation and the New School and everybody else, including the photography community, for the opportunity to be here and talk to you about my work today and actually just share this already wonderful occasion. I'm going to talk about Frederick Douglass. Um, and I'm going to propose that Douglas is a kind of um, ancestor or photographic theorist monkey that uh, until very recently we in the scholarly community have not realized that um, Douglas wrote some of the very earliest and most trenchant photography criticism and that it might be a different way to reconstruct the past and therefore the possible futures of the medium if we go back to that forgotten beginning of African-American theorists, um, photography theory, particularly from people um, who were born in slavery. So born a slave, Frederick Douglass paid particular attention to photography, actually. Throughout his life, he sat for numerous photographic portraits and he circulated them as widely as possible. He also wrote a number of articles and lectures on the subject. His ideas about photography are different from those articulated by many of his contemporaries, who were chiefly engaged by how well the camera reflected and cemented existing social relations. Like others of his generation, Douglas was interested in pictures of family and sentiment, but at his most intense, he looked to photography for kindling rather than for kinship. During slavery, Douglas heard in the click of the shutter a promise of the shackles release. If black people could appropriate the means, by means of the camera the power of objectification that slavery wielded, Douglas perceived that photography would become an agent of radical change. After emancipation, Douglas thought photography could be a tool for remaking the American imagination 
such photography was a visionary force offering an important avenue for change. Scholars have only very recently begun to attend seriously to Douglas's contributions to the theory of photography. They've only very recently even been published. In order to find Douglas's writings on photography, you had to go really to the archive in the Library of Congress and learn to read his handwriting and piece these things together from many, many pages of documents. Um, and so in my present, the, the talk today, I'm going to share some of the scholarship of what is to be discovered about Douglas's ideas about photography, particularly by comparing a lecture he published from 1861, which is called Pictures and Progress, with his major revision of that essay in 1865, which still exists only in manuscript. I believe that by closely reading and comparing each piece of writing, we can see how Douglas is in conversation with Lincoln over the image of the black man and the image of the American nation. Photography is central to that conversation. Each lecture contains a timely response to one of Lincoln's inaugural addresses. In the first, written at the outset of the Civil War, Douglas is troubled by Lincoln's hesitation to arm black troops. He proposes that the new technology of photography humanizes the image of the enslaved so that black men might be more widely seen as suitable recruits to the Union forces. In the 1865 revision, he encourages Lincoln and the country to anticipate the successful end of the Civil War and turn toward rebuilding the nation. And there, he tries to describe how photography could now disseminate a prophetic image of a newborn nation. Photography could make the likeness of a, quote, more perfect union that the Constitution had originally failed to deliver. This, I think, is a distinctly different potential of photography than the one in which many, many of us base our, uh, our thinking about photography. For instance, Camera Lucida. In Camera Lucida, translated into English in 1981, Roland Barthes famously describes the three positions from which many critics today analyze the institutions of photography, that of the operator of the camera, the spectator of the photograph, and the spectrum, or the target, he says, of the image. But in effect, I'm arguing, in both the pre- and post-slavery engagements with photography in the 1860s, Douglas excavates a fourth position, that of the revenant, or one who returns from the dead. Both Frederick Douglass and Roland Barthes wrote brilliant accounts of the nature of photography by the light of meditations on death. The death towards which Barthes was looking was individual, the death of his mother, a private loss for which photography was so personal a solace that Barthes would not publish the image that he found of his mother in his book about his search for that image. That death that concerned Douglas was massive, public, and socially transformative. Upwards of 20 million had suffered and died under the slave system, and at least 620,000 more people were killed in the war undertaken to end it. Amid such carnage, the position of this revenant that appeared to Douglas through photography was available to all who would seek an image of the new birth of justice by black inclusion in American society. The potential commonness of this vision, overlooked like a leaf of Whitman's grass, gave Douglas hope for national renewal. So, in December, on December 3rd, 1861, Frederick Douglass responded to an invitation to give a lecture at the Tremont Temple in Boston with a highly uncharacteristic act. Normally a powerful extemporaneous speaker, this time Douglass read his lecture out loud from a written text. The lecture was about photography, and Douglass apologized for doing so. Douglas was an enthusiast of the invention. Americans at the time generally understood photography to be a product of the union of science with nature. To Douglas, this new kind of picture promised to remedy what he saw as badly distorted visual representations of black people made by white artists. In the Tremont Temple talk, he emphasized how the invention of photography could be used for unraveling the problem of racist uh, representation praising Louis-Jacques Mondé Daguerre as the great father of our modern pictures, Douglas celebrated photography among the other advanced technologies of the age. He placed Daguerre in the company of other prominent inventors, such as James Watt, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Fulton, and Samuel F.B. Morse. 
He wrote, if by means of the all-pervading electric fluid, Morse has coupled his name with the glory of bringing the ends of the earth together and of co converting the world into a whispering gallery, Daguerre, by the simple but all abounding sunshine, has converted the planet into a picture gallery. He argued that the art of mechanical reproduction was a natural phenomenon. As munificent, he said, in the exalted arena of art as in the radiation of heat and light, the god of day not only decks the earth with rich fruit and beautiful flowers, but studs the world with pictures. And he called attention to the social impact of the accessibility of such an invention. All of Douglas's observations that day are staying quite within the territory of received opinion. Douglas, along with nearly everyone else at the time, espoused without any irony a belief in photography's democratizing influence. He wrote, he said, men of all conditions may see themselves as others see them. What was once the exclusive luxury of the rich and great is now within the reach of all. The humble servant girl whose income is but a few shillings per week may now possess a more perfect likeness of herself than noble ladies and court royalty with all its precious treasure purchase 50 years ago. And I think what Kristen showed us is actually how untrue that is. Who can possess these pictures in themselves? So he repeats this claim about the humble servant girl, and he's got a humble farmer boy as well. He observed that vanity fed photography because you can't go anywhere without people showing them you pictures of themselves and their children. However, about a quarter of the way into this talk, he abruptly changed course and he declared, but it is not of such pictures that I am here to speak. Douglas wanted to take the discussion of photography somewhere else. This was the second anniversary of the execution of John Brown and it found the country nearly a year into the Civil War that the wily old warrior had sought to ignite. Immediately after, Douglas, after Lincoln's election in January, seven southern states had seceded. In his inaugural address on March 4, 1861, Lincoln sought to persuade the South that there was no cause for war, even though Jefferson Davis had already been sworn in two weeks earlier as the president of the Confederacy. This is Lincoln. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies, Lincoln stressed. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bond of affection. Particularly, Lincoln sought to persuade the Confederacy that he would not interfere with the right to own slaves. Quote, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. In quick succession, Fort Sumter came under attack and more states left the Union. Douglas was appalled by Lincoln's inaugural speech. He did believe the slaveholder was his enemy and the war having finally begun, he found it was imperative to dedicate it to ending the peculiar institution that Lincoln seemed ready to protect. Therefore, as he stood reading about photography before the audience at the Tremont Temple on the second anniversary of John Brown's death, Douglas feared for his vision of race and nation. In direct response to Lincoln's remarks nine months earlier, Douglas attacked as many of the arguments of the inaugural as he could. It was essential to give up on the idea that slavery was legal and quote Douglas, have done with the wild and guilty fantasy that man can hold property in man. Douglas told the audience that the country must, quote, lay the ax at the root of the tree and hurl the accused, accursed slave system into the pit from whence it came. He found Lincoln's defense of the Union weak and dangerously conflicted. While I do not charge, he said, as some have, that the government is conducting the war on peace principles, it is plain that they are not conducting it on war principles. Chief among Lincoln's mistakes was his failure to enlist Southern slaves as soldiers, which could be fatal to the Union. We are fighting the rebels with only one hand when we ought to be fighting them with both, he told the audience. We are recruiting our troops at the North when we ought to be recruiting them at the South. We are striking with our white hand while our black hand is chained behind us. We are catching slaves instead of arming them. We are repelling our natural friends to win the friendship of our natural enemies. We are endeavoring to heal over the rotten cancer instead of cutting out its death-dealing roots and fibers. We seem a little more concerned for the safety of slavery than for the slavery of the republic. 
The government at Washington has shouldered all the burden of slavery in the prosecution of the war and given to its enemies all its benefits. Douglas found a mechanical analogy that explained how time itself was out of joint. It's something also that I think we resonate to now. The country was like a broken clock whose machinery needed to be fixed. The cause of our troubles is deeper down than sections, slaveholders, or abolitionists, Douglas said. These are but the hands of the clock. The moving machinery is behind the face. The machinery moves not because of the hands, but the hands move because of the machinery. To make the hands go right, you must make the machinery go right. The trouble is fundamental. But Douglas thought that change was inevitable. Nature herself was a picture of progress and a rebuke to moral stagnation. In the age of invention, he thought, nothing stands today where it stood yesterday. There is no standing still, nor can be. Political as well as technological realities were shifting. John Brown himself was an example of this process. Two years earlier, John Brown's own son was hunted in Ohio like a felon, but now he is captain under the broad seal of the US government. Meanwhile, those who came to torment John Brown in his jail cell, stretched out on a pallet of straw, covered with blood, marred by saber gashes in the hands of his enemies, not expecting to recover from his wounds, those people, Douglas said, were now themselves accused of treason and rebellion. And photography, an emblem of human progress, was another such rebuke. Underlying Douglas's attack on Lincoln's inaugural is a theory of photography as revolutionary vision. For Douglas, born a slave, the temporizing of Lincoln's defense of the legality of slavery in the slave states was just as much a distortion of reality as the grotesque images that white artists made of black faces and bodies, rendering them unacceptable to serve in the armed forces. Photographic seeing could help address that problem because it could correct the distorted representations of black manhood that put the union at risk. Viewed correctly, black men would come to life in the white imagination, and Lincoln would find the soldiers the Union needed to win the war and vindicate the government. But, Lincoln, but Douglas was thinking also beyond his quarrel with Lincoln. He also extrapolated from modern photography, the modernity of photography, an even greater principle of reform. Inside of man were images as well. And these, too, could be improved upon by the progress that was epitomized by photography. Rightly viewed, Douglas said, he learned from photography that the whole soul of man is a sort of picture gallery, a grand panorama in which all the great facts of the universe in tracing the things of time and the things of eternity are painted. Photography showed mankind its own right vision Technological progress could bring about not only the external, but the inner nature of man, the dreams of his soul in thoughts of pictures. OK, so this talk that Douglas gave, this Tremont Temple talk, was not a success. <laughs> the audience was impatient with Douglas's abstract reasoning, and it was disappointed that he did not stick entirely to the sensational subject that he was famous for, abolition, speaking about it from the former from the point of view of a former slave. One reviewer remarked that the audience was listless and unattentive. Only at the end of the lecture, another reviewer wrote, when he saved himself by switching off suddenly from his subject, that is photography, and pitching in on the great questions of the day, that is the Civil War, did the audience become attentive and enthusiastic. Now, Douglas, of course, had been pitching in on the war the entire time. But those who heard him couldn't place his thoughts about photography in that context. Sharing his meditations on photography and speaking like a transcendentalist, Douglas himself, it seemed to those who heard him, Douglas himself was out of place speaking about photography. But Douglas did not cease to think about the uses of photography as prophecy. And in 1865, he responded to another invitation to give a public lecture by trying again. Unlike the Tremont Temple talk that he gave early in the war, this lecture was never reviewed, so we don't actually know if he's more successful with the public this time around. But it's clear from his changes to the text that his thoughts had deepened. First of all, when he gave the earlier lecture, he was not conscious of the prejudice that his audience would hold against a black man speaking about this subject. Four years later, he was much more aware of the flashpoints revealed by the bad reviews of his first lecture. 
and at the same time, he was equally, if not more, engaged with the potential of photography in the field of reform. His fear of compromise was gone. Not only did Lincoln's recent re-election indicate, finally, that the Union would, after all, prevail, the sound defeat of his rival promised that at the war's end, the country would unite around the end of slavery. Douglas could now finally say, quote, the American people are not remarkable for moderation. They despise halfness. They will go with him who goes longest and stay with him who stays longest. When the country thinks of halfness and half measures, what it thinks of that is seen by the last election. We repudiate such men and all such measures. The people said to the Chickahominy hero, we do abhor and spur you, spurn you and all whose sympathies are like yours. And to Abraham Lincoln, they say, go forward. Don't stop where you are but onward. Very significantly, Douglas had also changed his opinion of Lincoln, who he no longer thought of as the walking dead. In the second version of Pictures in Progress, Douglas is again in dialogue with the president, but this time he is concerned with photography's ability to replenish both the de devastated nation and its exhausted leader. He opened the second version by explaining that he was conscious that the minds of his audience would be weighted down by the stupendous contest upon which depends for the weal or woe this des the destiny of this great nation. He said, the fact is that the whole thought of the nation during the last four years has been closely and strongly riveted to this one subject. Every fact and every phase of this mighty struggle has been made the subject of exhausting discussion. The pulpit, the press, and the platform, political and literary, the street and the fireside, have thought of little else and spoken of little else during these all, long, all these long four years of battle and blood. When Douglas wrote this second version of his lecture on photography, the war was rapidly drawing to its close. Douglas thought that the Confederacy was perishing. It had become evident that, he wrote, Slavery, hitherto paramount and priceless, may be far less valuable than an army, that the Negro can be more useful as a soldier than as a slave. The slave powers supply of energy, he said, like the moving machinery behind the face of the clock of the country that he had described earlier was broken, and the time of the Confederacy was doomed. Yet Douglas also recognized that exhaustion threatened the Union as well. And in this connection, his expansive thoughts about photography could be of use. Douglas had no question that the war had been worth it, but he was worried especially about its cost to Lincoln. On the occasion of his second oath of office, despite clear signs to the contrary, Lincoln had refused to predict the Union's victory. The war was not yet officially over, and he claimed that, quote, this is Lincoln, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first precisely because, quote, the great contest still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, such that little that is new could be presented. Lincoln was pensive and subdued. He wrote, and these are words that many of you know, neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration with which it, which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental. Douglas acknowledged the vital need to stay the weary and difficult course. But in answer to Lincoln, Douglas asserted that now was the time to develop a new and more expansive idea of what would have been accomplished once the war was over. He said, the people can afford to listen for a moment to some other topic. There is no danger of being injuriously diverted from the one grand fact of the hour. The bow will be unbent occasionally in order to retain its elastic spring and effective power, and the same is true of the mind. Thoughts that rise from the horrors of the battlefield, like the gloomy exhalations from the dampness and death of the grave, are depressing to the spirit and impair the health. One hour's relief from the intense, oppressive, and heart-aching attention to the issues involved in the war may be of service to all. Douglas felt that the weary Union was in need of new perspectives. In his second inaugural address, Lincoln had acknowledged that the old offense of slavery was dying. 
while God gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Somberly, Lincoln said, with malice towards none, with charity for all. His best hope was that the nation could achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. But Douglas thought the people should do more than bind up their wounds. They should harness the moral chemistry of the universe to continue the work of progress. The elastic spring and effective power that Douglas sought for the country would come now once again from the contemplation of pictures. To a historian of photography, it is interesting to find Douglas still enthralled by Daguerre in 1865. Douglas, it, uh, he, he, he again, he again talked about the progress of the time. The art of today differs from that of other ages as the education of today differs from that of other ages. The printing press of modern times turning off 2,000 sheets an hour differs from the tedious and laborious processes by which the earlier thoughts of men were saved by oblivion. But once again, his focus is not on the literal history of photography. It's on the existence of something wider and grander, a field of thought that lies open before us. Douglas this time directly acknowledged that it was not common for a former slave to speak about photography. And yet, when the war nearly finished, Douglas was determined to show his audiences that his was a black American's point of view. Pardon me, Douglas told his listeners in the most complex tone of the entire second lecture. Pardon me if I should be found discoursing on Negroes when I should be speaking of pictures. But in reality, he told them, he had little choice. When I come onto the platform, the Negro is very apt to come with me. I cannot forget him, and you would not if I did. His friend Sojourner Truth, he confided, had told him that she does not speak to tell people what they don't know, but to tell them what she herself knows. He would have to give the speech that he was sent into the world to make, and that would be an abolition speech about photography. Pictures and Progress is certainly among the most extensive theoretical works on the uses of photography to be written from the point of view of a former slave. From Douglas's perspective, American nature might be a vast and glorious expanse which awes and thrills, but American social space could also be sublime. The distance that Douglas had traveled from slavery to self-actualization was literally vast, and Douglas knew that photography held the potential to help others also bridge that chasm. His very manhood was a result of his picture-making imagination. The tremendous originality of this theoretical engagement has yet to be fully explored. I would argue that Douglas's dialogue with Lincoln makes him a forerunner of what Lee Rayford in Imprisoned in a Luminous Glare has called photography's, quote, critical black consciousness, which she identifies as a body of African-American photographic thought that ranges from anti-lynching activists in the late 19th century through the Black Panthers in the 20th. Specifically, Douglas countered the death in life that was slavery's social truth with a radical vision of the potential life force to be gained through the photographic instrument. As such, Douglas's ideas critique contemporary representations of death as the ultimate truth of the photographic image. This can be seen, for instance, by comparing Douglas to Roland Barthes' thought in Camera Lucida. There, Barthes describes three standpoints from which to analyze a photograph. He, Bart says, a photograph can be the object of three practices or of three emotions or of three intentions, to do, to undergo, or to look. The operator is the photographer. The spectator is ourselves, all of us who glance through collections of photographs in magazines and newspapers, in books, albums, and archives. And the person or the thing photographed is the target, the referent, a kind of little simulacrum which I should like to call the spectrum of the photograph because this word retains through its root a relation to spectacle and it adds to it that rather terrible thing which there is in every photograph, the return of the dead, the specter. To the first standpoint, that of the operator, Barth makes no claim. I'm not a photographer. 
As for the second, the spectator, he, he famously derives his critical phenomenology by placing himself at the center. So I resolved to start my inquiry with no more than a few photographs, the ones I was sure existed for me. But towards the final third standpoint, that of the spectrum, that person or that thing that undergoes photography, Bart felt antipathy. He is fearful and rejecting of getting his picture made. To be photographed was to endure a very subtle moment when, to tell the truth, I am neither subject nor object, but a subject who feels he is becoming an object. I then experience a micro version of death. I am truly becoming a specter. To Bart, this mo moment of reification is intolerable. When I discover myself in the process of this operation, what I see is that I have become total image, which is to say, death in person. Others, the other, do not possess me of my, dispossess me of myself. They turn me ferociously into an object. They put me at their mercy, at their disposal, classified in a file, ready for the subtlest deceptions. His privacy and his civil rights are violated. The private life is nothing but that zone of space, of time, where I am not an image, an object. It is my political right to be a subject, which I must protect. Barth experienced his submission to photography in much the same way that Frederick Douglass experienced submission to slavery as social death. But Barth starts out alive and then dies into his picture, whereas the slave starts out as a social corpse and is animated through the photograph. This terrible thing that was there in every photograph was for Barth a subject who feels he is becoming an object. But for Douglass, the objectification of the photograph doubled back against the previous lack of a political right to be a subject, making a thing out of the making of a thing exposed the entire reifying process. The question of slavery comes up explicitly in Camera Lucida only once, in connection with Richard Avedon's photograph of William Casby in its caption, Born a Slave. I think again, writes Barthes, of William Casby, Born a Slave, photographed by Avedon. The meaning here is intense. For the man I see there has been a slave. He certifies that slavery has existed, not so far from us. And he certifies that this not by historical testimony, but by a new, somehow experiential order of proof, though it is in the past which is in question, a proof no longer merely induced, the proof according to St. Thomas seeking to touch the resurrected Christ. I remember keeping for a long time a photograph I had cut out of a magazine, lost subsequently like everything else to carefully put away, which showed a slave market, the slave master in his hat standing, the slaves in loincloths sitting, I repeat, a photograph, not a drawing or engraving, or my horror and my fascination uh, came from this. But this, there was a certainty that such a thing had existed, not a question of exactitude, but of reality. The historian was no longer the mediator. Slavery was given without mediation. The fact was established without method. Caseby is an old man who incontestably was born a slave. Yet Bart sees only the, frozen of the freezing of time in the present day face of this man, ignoring the fact of a long life after slavery. It is as if, as if for Bart, Caseby is still a slave wearing the mask of that social situation. Douglas too was born a slave, but he sees himself differently. And what I'm gonna do is go through, I simply have a series of the photographs. Douglas was the most photographed famous American of the 19th century. More photographs than Lincoln, more photographs than Whitman. John Stauffer, who has just published a magnificent book of his well, collecting of hundreds of Douglas uh, images, um, uh, has, they have done the tabulation. And Douglas, throughout his life, had himself photographed. Okay? This is Frederick Douglas, born a slave. Douglas is aware of the counter, counter history of slavery. This is the Louis Agassiz file that Harvard University has of the photographs taken by Zeely at a plantation in South Carolina meant to uh, prove that um, uh, African American slaves um, uh, do, really, actually it's a social experiment. They're trying to figure out whether 
if you're a second generation and you're born on the plantation, you're a, a finer specimen um, than if you're uh, simply brought straight to the plantation from uh, Guinea. A solemn Lincoln might tell the country to hope for the future, and a few weeks after that, Lincoln was dead. But Douglas believed that photography would have to materialize that future first in order for hope to survive. What we have in this string of images, I believe, is evidence of how determined Douglas is to insert himself into the gallery of illustrious Americans as a living image of that progress. Such a degree of consistency as he displays throughout his life in this the assumption of a persona and a pose, I think has to be willed. Even while other kinds of pictures of him also exist, that doesn't diminish the significance for me of this particular performance. Over time, when Douglas might easily have wavered, he never did. As a revenant, or one who has returned from social death, he apparently gathered himself up from social death in each and every instance and projected his vision of a more perfect likeness of the nation. We don't want to end on that. OK, thank you. Dear Grandad, I never met you. And the family from the time when I was a child never talked about you. Except once. Dad had mentioned in passing that you had died in China in the 1940s. And for some reason, had a monument built to you. I thought it was strange that you, having been born in Hong Kong, and then taken as a baby to Malaya, where you grew up, lived, and worked, would have died back in our ancestral village in China. Your father had left the village at the turn of the 20th century, along with a wave of migrant Chinese laborers headed for Southeast Asia, America, Australia, and Africa. And why did the family never talk about you in the 60 years since your death? Why does grandma's gravestone not bear your name? 10 years ago, when I was going to be posted to China as a foreign correspondent for a newspaper, I pestered dad and his older brother about you. They were reluctant to talk. One Chinese New Year on my visit home, my mom handed me a black and white photograph. The man in the photograph stood confidently, hands on hip. He was not tall, had a high forehead and thick lips. And a camera was slung around his neck. Another photographer in the family? I was intrigued. Eventually, Otis' uncle coughed up a letter from his drawers. It was one of many letters relatives in our ancestral village had written to us over the last 60 years. But we never replied to them. The family wanted to forget you, forget China, and forget that chapter of history. I called the only phone number on the letter and introduced myself as your granddaughter. They thought I was lying and tested me by asking me to name all your five children. On New Year's Day in 2011, I got on a bus in Hong Kong and rode seven hours north to Meizhou City in southern China. I looked around the old town. Are these the same roads you walked? the same things you saw. I took a van back to our village, going past the jetty that great granddad had left China from in the late 1800s, and the same steps you must have walked back up when you returned to China in the 1940s. I met our relatives. I found the house that great granddad had built and where you had lived when you returned. I looked for traces of you and observed the rituals in this hundred-year-old house where our relatives farm, live, gamble, and sometimes eat rat for breakfast. 
I asked them how you came back here in 1949, in the final months of the civil war between the communists and the nationalists in China. I heard how you were chased down, surrounded, arrested, and then jailed by the nationalists because you had joined a communist guerrilla army unit in our home village. I learned how you were eventually executed in July of 1949 by the nationalists, just two months before the communists declared victory over China. Your side won, but all that remains of you is this monument in our village to your martyrdom. And this photograph, the only thing the relative said you had brought back with you from British Malaya. It was your prison photograph. It bears your detainee number. Your eyes seem to have lost the luster they once had. Painful as it was, oldest uncle began to open up. We found old family albums. In one picture, it looks like you were in your high school basketball team. You were squatting in the front row, first from left, posing as if you were trying to keep that hairy mole on your left arm in the shadows. I now know that mole was how your body was identified from amongst the corpses in the mass grave you were left in after execution. I now know that in the 1930s, you had been a school principal and then a leftist journalist and photographer in Northern Malaya. You were a community leader. By all accounts, you were an advocate for social justice. Like most overseas Chinese who still cared for China, you and grandma did theater in the streets to raise money for the anti-Japanese war in China. You were arrested and waterboarded by the Japanese for this. They hung you from a tree. You survived and continued being active in politics, culture, and intellectual circles. When the British returned after the war, you were part of an anti-colonial wave of sentiment. You made anti-British speeches. You were the chief editor of a leftist newspaper in Northern Malaya and published anti-British editorials. As the winds of the Cold War were blowing everywhere around the world, you were arrested by the British who had declared emergency rule in Malaya as the communist-led resistance grew. The guerrillas in the dense jungles across Malaya sabotaged British rule and the tin and rubber supply that the British relied on from its prized colony. The British solution to this was to round up 31,000 leftists like you and deport you all to China, whether you had been born there or not. That's how you ended up in China. It was an all-out war in every way but name. The British called it the Malayan Emergency. It was a war that lasted 12 years and left families broken and traumatized. History is written by the victors and this trauma became buried with time in the bodies of my uncle and other families like ours. I wanted to understand this trauma, this amnesia. I wanted to understand you, the political choices you made, the fire you had in your belly. I traveled around southern China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore to do our history interviews with other Malayan leftists whose lives paralleled yours. They fought against the British and got deported or exiled. I met men and women, now well into their 90s, who were the foot soldiers of what they saw as a just national liberation revolution, like in so many other places in the third world at the time. I asked them why they wanted the British out. I asked them what it was like to be on those ships being deported to China. I met many who were lucky, unlike you, and lived on to find good jobs in communist China. I met others who stayed on in Malaya and went into the jungles to fight to establish a communist state for the next 30 years, living in the rainforest between Malaysia and Thailand. They had their own field hospitals, 
radio station, printing press, and made their own weapons. They went on fighting for the idea and ideal of communism, laying down arms only in 1989. Some remain exiled today in the jungles of southern Thailand. They gave their lives to a failed revolution. And most are now fading from the scene. I drove around northern Malaysia and southern Thailand in the towns where you had lived, worked, and in the so-called black areas where the communists were active, where they had ambushed British soldiers, shot British rubber estate managers, where they had hid in limestone caves, and lived with tigers and elephants in the jungles. I visited the old tin mines founded by the British, and that jail where they had kept you. I went to the cemeteries of Commonwealth soldiers who were killed by the so-called bandits and communist terrorists. One of their graves reads, one day we'll understand. In our family, this buried chapter of the Cold War left grandma and great-grandma to raise your five children without you. I feel I can understand the choices you made in those turbulent times of big politics. The family now thinks the genes skipped the generation and your sense of social purpose passed on to me. But grandma must have been very angry when she said you chose politics over family. And she must have been thoroughly heartbroken to lose you. She never remarried. One day, we might understand. We just heard a letter written by Sim Chien to her grandfather. Chien is a photographer and a researcher from Singapore, based in Beijing, who has been working over the past six years to excavate the stories of her grandfather and anti-colonial activists of his generation, collecting alternative stories currently not in any official archive. She's developing the project for a book, academic research and exhibitions, examining memory, amnesia, trauma, and counter narratives. Um, I'm Emma Raines, I'm the director of programs. Um, I'd like to invite the Augmented Histories panel up to the stage, please. We're really excited to have the, these uh, four presenters with us. Um, these four presenters will share projects that use augmented reality to engage with histories in our surroundings, public spaces, and lived environments. They are telling stories that are grounded in specific geographies, allowing audiences to feel strong relationships between history and their physical surroundings. Their work reframes our understanding of places and histories, and in some cases even provides us with radical visions of the future. Several of the presenters here um, uh, participated in our experimental laboratory a few weeks back. Um, they're their ideas are still in their initial stages, they're still um, thinking through, um, and they're sharing their work today, which is fantastic. It take, takes some bravery to do that sometimes. Um, others are more formulated, and um, so there's gonna be a mix of ideas and actualized work here today. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce each of them, and then we'll pass the mic along and you can do your presentations. Um, Hector René Membro Canales is a photographer whose work explores institutional power and patriotism. Hector will share After Oz Mendeus, a new project that scrutinizes representations of American history and power through the remains of monumental sculptures and their empty plinths. This is Hector to my left. Um, Robert Pluma is a Mexican-American and Coahuitican documentary artist 
whose work examines inequality in order to generate shifts in perspective and systemic change. The project he's sharing today is an exploration of histories created by divergent cultures colliding during the Spanish colonization of what is now South Texas. Give a little wave, Robert. <laughs> Anne Goodfriend is an interaction and user experience designer. She's worked with her colleagues Jordan Frand and Sheer David to create Village Live, a smartphone application that walks you through queer history of the West Village guided by the 1980s video archive of artist Nelson Sullivan. Anne and her colleagues will be sharing a demonstration of the project during the break. Nicole. Give a little wave over there, Nicole. Nicole Merrickin is a public scholar and a culture, cultural worker with a background in studio art, social practice, and education. Nicole will share a collaborative project that seeks to recover the history, sights, and sounds of the student movement for, for justice in Chicago schools between 1968 and 73. I want to thank again before they begin the fledgling fund for making the lab possible and all the ideation that happened there. Um, and Hector, here's the clicker and here's the mic. Just the green button. Okay. There we go. So uh, before I can describe uh, how the Counter Histories Lab influenced my project, I should probably explain uh, the project as it was before I brought it to Brown Institute. Um, my personal and professional interests, both as an artist as well as an army photographer, uh, concerns itself with how official histories are recorded and constructed. Uh, classic examples of military myth-making uh, are seemingly contradictory. Uh, Pictured here is Napoleon crossing the Alps, uh, the romantic version, uh, and then on the right is the realistic version by Della Roche. Um, and this be uh, begs the question is of how we address uh, multiple histories, our couple bias, and how institutions use imagery to shape narratives of strength and power. Uh, this is what Nato Thompson refers to as culture as weapon. Um, this, of course, is what made the Charlottesville um, riot such a consequential moment. Uh, the Unite the Right rally was, in fact, uh, in opposition to remove a statue of Robert E. Lee from Emancipation, Emancipation Park, uh, where 19 people were injured and uh, one was killed. Uh, in researching uh, public monuments, I came across a 40-page a uh, comprehensive report from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, and in it, it outlines how there are uh, currently 1,500, over 1,500 Confederate symbols uh, in public spaces. Uh, their audit details uh, who is uh, being vilified or, or uh, championed, uh, when it was constructed, and uh, its location. Um, what this research showed is that it would be 40 years until we would see uh, the first Confederate monument. And that's mostly because the South was just so financially devastated. So it should come as no surprise that many of these monuments were built during the Jim Crow era, as well as the Civil Rights era. Shortly after Charlottesville, I began documenting the empty plinths I could track down and uh, travel to. Uh, these images were photographed between Maryland, New York, and Georgia. Uh, now, before attending the lab, I considered this project mostly existing as photographs, uh, whether on a gallery wall, in a book, or on the internet. Uh, but the lab introduced uh, participants to uh, intensive workshops, screenings, artist talks, project development, and I'm still learning the difference between AR, VR, and MR. Um, which reminds me, I should probably thank Ziv and uh, Dan Archer for all their help, as well as my work group, uh, Chris, Mercedes, who I saw here earlier, and Alice, uh, because uh, the progress wouldn't have been possible without the, the work groups. 
Uh, I also want to thank whoever suggested uh, bringing architectural Legos to the workshop, because that was a lot of fun. So uh, when Emma mentioned that some of us are not as far along as others, that would be me. So here are some sketches. Uh, but during the lab, uh, you're shown examples of new media technology, such as 3D scans, augmented reality overlay, location-based content, and uh, creating audio guides uh, from oral histories. Um, so these are my drawings of what it could look like. Uh, these empty plinths are an opportunity for us to consider their meaning. Uh, we live in this moment when ideologies change far faster than we can dedicate monuments. It would be interesting to collaborate with historians, curators, local municipalities, and cultural institutions to create virtual monuments that comprehensively contextualize the values of our time. So essentially, we could turn all our smartphones into mobile museums. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to take a look at some experiments and prototypes I've been working on the last couple of weeks. There we go. Uh, this began as a personal family project to learn more about our indigenous ancestors and trace our connection to Mission San Jose, which you see here, one of five early 18th century Spanish Catholic missions in San Antonio, Texas, recently designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the most famous being Mission Valero, better known as the Alamo. My grandfather and his siblings were among the last generation to live on mission land before it came fully under US government control. We traced my family's presence on the mission back for centuries. We found legal documents, photographs, and maps in official and unofficial archives, including a map showing the exact room in the so-called Indian quarters our ancestors lived in. We explored old family photos belonging to my grandfather's aunt, Tia Emma. She's no longer with us, and had I not asked her about the photographs then, we never would have been able to gather context for many of these images. What other stories, images, and artifacts might be lost once their keepers are gone? How many of them are cataloged only to end up in stasis and out of public view because they don't fit the official narrative? Along the way, I discovered San Antonio's significance as a point of origin for the American West and its associated culture. One example is Rancho de las Cabras, which you'll see in just a moment. It was an autonomously run uh, farm, run by indigenous locals who developed the ranching techniques and culture which have become more closely associated with later arriving Anglo settlers and modern white Texan identity. Mid 19th century Mexico is often praised for rejecting slavers and humane, but the brutality of the army of Santa Ana, the self-proclaimed Napoleon of the continent, cannot be denied, including at the Battle of the Alamo. There's a prevalent myth that everyone at the Alamo was killed but an ancestor of mine, Regido Guerrero, was one of only two Texian Alamo defenders said to have survived after locking himself in the Alamo jail and convincing invading Mexican soldiers that he was a prisoner of war. Another ancestor, Jose Maria Guerrero, is said to have both died fighting at the Alamo and to have lived to an old age, to provide an example of how wildly divergent historical accounts can be. Extensive migration into and out of the region, a dehumanizing Spanish human classification and caste system, which you see here, adapted from their conquests on other continents, decades of brutal wars, and an integration of divergent cultures all shaped the region surrounding San Antonio, its people, and the dominant narratives we use today to understand many paths of history. So after this eye-opening historical excursion, I wanted to connect these personal narratives I grew up around to the overlooked histories I was beginning to learn about. So. Uh, smash cut to the incredible Counter Histories Alternative Narratives Lab I was so fortunate to be a part of. It made it possible to rapid prototype a design for a location-based augmented reality application. There you see those Legos again, they were great. Uh, this application will allow visitors to the mission of San Antonio to discover images, oral histories, and other stories, which will offer different perspectives and hopefully begin to decolonize some of the, de the cemented histories which have a tendency to omit the experience of colonized people and their descendants. My family's history will open up the conversation and serve as an invitation to other families connected to the missions to share their own stories. And we'll also invite guides who have maybe a certain level of expertise who don't have a direct connection to the mission to participate. This is a site-specific application which can easily scale to include new locations and possibly become a modular platform which will allow you to interact with and geolocate 
any oral histories and associated images or objects, whether virtual or real. It is not a replacement for, real for reality, but rather a supplement to it. The interface is pared down and audio driven, encouraging less screen time on site and more interaction with their surroundings and fellow visitors. The application will prompt discussion with park rangers to unlock new elements within. This is a tile that you scan at the beginning, uh, reminiscent of one that my grandfather would help make in the old workshop at the mission. Uh, you scan this to orient yourself on the, on the land. Uh, then the users will be guided down a path, which takes them past a geofence coinciding with an old workshop foundation, which will activate the sounds of the workshop. It will then lead them to the famous rose window, where they can engage with the multiple mythologies of its creation and decide for themselves which one to believe. Uh, so uh, some of the types of interaction you'll see are, are the geofence I was just describing, where you'll walk past the, um, an old foundation for a, for a workshop, and you'll hear the sounds of the workshop, and you'll be prompted to possibly have the option to uh, engage with that story. Or you can actually save it for la later in the archives that you see here. That way you're not spending all your time just staring at a screen when you're at this amazing historical site. Um, the archives will also be used by educational institutions, hopefully, who will be able to effectively assign homework to go collect these stories and then research them later uh, as part of their assignment. So um, after these orientation steps, users will be free to roam and discover on their own, building their own archive of these stories. Uh, they'll interact with visuals, audio connected to people, objects, and locations. Uh, they can watch, listen, and read on the spot if they choose, or they can view their archive later, as I mentioned. Uh, so just a quick example of uh, some of the content that people engage with. Here's my grandfather uh, just maybe two weeks ago seeing some of the tiles that he didn't realize were still there in a building behind the mission um, that he was involved in the workshop making. Um, here he is again, uh, his name is Victor Vallejo Guerrero with his brother Roy Guerrero at an old aqueduct, called a, they're called acequias, uh, that would irrigate the land and they were telling me about how their uncle would use the acequias to irrigate his farm. And here he's talking about his time running along the tops of the walls of the mission uh, when he was a child. And uh, these are the kinds of stories we want to share to start opening up pathways to these sort of deeper, more complex histories. Uh, another type of content we want to use, uh, these, uh, I guess I would call them video portraits, uh, incredibly slow motion uh, to give the viewer some time to sort of absorb the audio history without necessarily having a, a whole distracting video going on. You can see on the right there, for example, my grandfather half pretending, half actually starting to climb up the walls like he was telling me about. Uh, so um, I hope to encourage people engaging this material to view the histories encounter with more skepticism and curiosity and to approach official narratives with a critical point of view. Um, we want to expand the histories a bit um, to include not just the missions. We'll start with just Mission San Jose, where my family is from. Start including a bunch of the other missions and then possibly go out to all other regions of San Antonio and go into these deeper histories about how indigenous people were treated. Uh, there's a lot of that, that that we'd love to do, but just as one particular very personal example, I'll leave you with um, this photograph of my grandmother, uh, Hortensia Hernandez Guerrero. She's seen here outside of Shilo's, a German restaurant she was not allowed into when she was growing up in San Antonio. The sign outside making this all too clear read, no dogs, no Mexicans, no blacks. This portrait was made in the alley beside the restaurant just uh, a week or two ago. Um, once she, uh, and this is the window that she had to order food from when she was a teenager in this, uh, in this side alley. So uh, we went inside after to sit down and eat at a table. She had a peach cobbler and I had a root beer float. Um, so I'm here to talk today about Village Live. Uh, Village Live is an augmented reality walking tour it presents a view into the queer history of the West Village, and it uses the archive of a man named Nelson Sullivan. So these are the Chelsea Piers today. They're pretty nice looking. You probably wouldn't guess from looking at them, but 30 years ago, they looked like this. So this is footage from the archive of Nelson Sullivan. Um, Nelson was really obsessed with his camcorder, and he carried it around with him everywhere. He documented the downtown scene, particularly the nightlife um, throughout the village and the Lower East Side. So his footage includes a lot of really important queer luminaries like RuPaul, Andy Warhol, uh, Keith Haring. You can see some more of those here. 
Um, so we started looking at Nelson's archive and we thought we want to find a way to tell the story present here. Um, so we were like, how can we find an innovative way to present this history and get people kind of moving around the West Village while accessing this archive? So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the process for that, but before we start, I'm just gonna show you a demo so you can get a sense of the experience of the app we built. I want to take you everywhere I go. Doing these tapes for for so long, nobody was trying to document the continuity of, of the situation here in New York. Just to even get a, a, a big picture for, for future reference. Or I didn't see anyone with a simple tool like a video camera just taking a picture that, that records reality as it's happening. I was at Stonewall and I didn't even realize it. I was with my brother from South Carolina up in Parkchester and I wanted to come to Greenwich Village. I got on the IRT and I got off the thing at Christopher Street. Here I was in Greenwich Village, had no idea it was a gay riot. And only a few years later did I put two and two together and realize that it was history in the making. with something very special. Let's see what it's going to be. Okay, so this project really rose out of a personal concern of ours as members of the queer community. So I work with two collaborators, uh, Sheer David and Jordan Frand. Um, and we thought, you know, we want to make something, we'd been looking at Nelson's archive and we thought, we want to make something that brings sort of safety back into public space, sort of a rallying cry to get people back out reclaiming the streets. Um, so we thought, you know, Nelson's archive is a great way to tell this story. So we started this project just by taking a deep dive. There's over 2,000 hours of footage, so we just had to watch a lot of video. We started to kind of create a storyline, a nonlinear storyline, and then we thought about which tech we should use. So as we were thinking about this, we realized this is really a project about public space. We want to get people moving through public space and we want them associating that space with this kind of history. So this is the perfect opportunity for augmented reality because we can layer this content actually into the streets of New York. So we started to research successful use cases for augmented reality, came up with kind of a scenario of best practices, uh, spoke with experts in the field, and whenever possible just put the product in front of people to get their feedback. Um, so in the end, we came up with a location-based mobile augmented reality app where we have this non-linear story that drives the experience and we actually place this archival content into the streets. So users, when they load the app, they select a location off the map where they're given walking directions. Once they get to the site, they're given a preview of a marker to scan and when they scan that marker, they get to see video footage filmed in that exact location over 30 years ago. Um, in addition to this, we made a series of 360 videos that approximate the experience and live on the web. We wanted to give access to this experience not only to people in New York, um, and also to people who maybe couldn't be out on the streets physically. Um, so we just think Nelson tells this story really well, and we're really excited to have had the opportunity to work with his archive. Um, we've been working on this for almost two years, so this is a project we've been working on for quite some time, and we've been grateful to have the support, um, a lot of support along the way. Um, more recently, we've been demoing the experience, and we've started to think of, you know, as augmented reality is something we've really come to believe in. We really feel that it offers this unique form of storytelling. And we start to think, are there other archives, other cultural institutions, other organizations we can kind of create this type of experience for. We've been thinking more often than not of Village Live as almost a framework. And we've started 
uh, building out a plan for what's called History Live, which is actually a platform where we can share these types of experiences um, and provide tools to cultural institutions, museums, and other historians to actually create uh, custom augmented reality walking tours and other people can access them through this platform. So we've been moving forward with Village Live and also sort of pressing forward with History Live, which we're getting really excited about. And I just wanna take a moment to thank, you know, Jordan Friend and Sheer David, who have been just, we all work so hard on this, um, and all the institutions that have supported us along the way, and also just all of you for being here um, to hear about the project. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nicole Marroquin, and um, I wanna talk for a little bit about um, the project I've been working on, and then I'll tell you where I've gotten um, with planning uh, some of this augmented reality into my project. Um, it's really a work in progress. <laughs> um, but uh, let me start out by saying I'm very interested in um, the point of view of young people and what they see. Um, this is a photo I just found on eBay. I'm um, an eBay uh, picture uh, hunter. I spend late nights digging and looking, and um, I found this one um, probably about three weeks ago, and it started making me think about this project that I've been working on for five years in a new way, which I'll explain in just a second. Um, the center of this is um, students from Benito Juarez Community Academy High School in Chicago on the Lower West Side. Um, and my partner in this project, um, Paulina Camacho, is here today. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about this in this context, looking at the photos and then also looking at some of the work that students have made. Um, so uh, at the beginning of this project, um, uh, I like to sort of lay out this map. There's two schools on the Lower West Side that are one school. Um, so Harrison High School had um, a student uprising in 1968, and then Froebel, which is the ninth grade branch of the same school, about a mile away, had um, a, another um, student rebellion in 1973. Um, but I wanna start with um, Harrison really quick. Uh, what happened at Harrison was uh, um, uh, two students, uh, Victor Adams and Sharon Matthews, um, led a massive citywide walkout. Um, they were protesting unbelievable conditions, um, including uh, um, huge dropout rates. Um, this mandatory black studies that they've finally gotten instituted was taught by white teachers who were very reluctant to teach it, and you'd be amazed at the things that they considered to be uh, black studies. Um, and uh, there was also, uh, soon after the um, Tuleta Loco massacre, um, uh, Latin American students who joined, who, um, because we were uh, categorized as white in Chicago public schools at the time, we were invisible sort of uh, in the statistics. So the recovery of this has been based on like surname um, hunts and it's, it's still uh, a lot of work left to be done on this project. But so um, at the height of this uh, walkout, um, oh, there was an 80% dropout rate among uh, Latin American students at Harrison, too. Um, so at the height of this, um, students marched to the Afro Arts Theater, and um, some people that came to be lead organizers in Harold Washington's campaign, um, including Rudy Lozano, was a part of this. Um, and at the Afro Arts Theater, was um, known for the place where the Pharaohs and um, later um, Sun Ra Orchestra and um, Earth, Wind and Fire was sort of their home base. It was a, an arts and theater center at 39th and Drexel. So um, this photo, though, is what got me started. I found it, and it's um, of the date when um, the Latin American students, um, mostly Mexican and Mexican American, and the black students got together to, to write uh, parallel manifestos. Um, and I couldn't believe that I couldn't find anything written about this aside from just a handful of um, academic papers, as in like four. Um, and so I started to like work on making some images of this myself. I wanna bring back this, uh, recover this history, uh, particularly of Sharon Matthews, who 
worked on this uh, citywide coalition building project as a teenager. Um, you know, the kind of organizing we don't even really have right now. Um, and so let me jump really quickly um, to talk about Froebel. Um, a little bit later, um, there was a massive uprising of parents and teachers and students at uh, Froebel. And I found this picture on eBay too. <laughs> And I couldn't find where it was printed in, in a newspaper for a really long time until really recently. And so what we've been doing is taking this material and bringing it directly to the students for whom the stakes are the highest, which are the students that go to Benito Juarez now, which is a school that was built as a result of these uprisings, right? People fighting for a better school, for a newer building, for a building that, that uh, would be closer to where most of these students lived. Um, and the photos have a lot of complicated things happening. So I've been um, interviewing um, elders in the community. I actually live like two blocks from where Froebel had stood. Nobody would, would talk to me about it. It took a long time, about two years to even find a photo of the school. And so I sit down with folks and, and um, uh, these guys, for example, told me that uh, the police officer who was injured here got hit in the face by a brick trying to get the students off the roof who were you know, trying to um, bring on the rebellion, uh, the revolution. Um, he actually sat in his car for two hours waiting for the photographer to arrive. So um, uh, there was also uh, the Red Squad uh, police officers posing as students inside the schools. Um, students were very fascinated, couldn't believe that they didn't know about it. So we do these critical rereads. Um, we uh, try to figure out what's happening inside of the pictures, but you know, I didn't teach them how to look critically at the media. They know all about it in Chicago. So recently I started getting my hands on some of the, um, black, uh, the Brown Beret images um, from uh, people that I've met um, sharing pieces of their collection. This is um, from um, another meeting about the schools at the Kasatzlan. Um, and finding out who some of the women were that led this work. Um, and so, the ninth graders um, who are at the center of this are the, we're talking to ninth graders now. And so we've organized um, sort of curriculum using primary sources, talking about collage. This is student work using some Xeroxes of our primary sources. Um, and this is one of the ways that we initially um, engaged with the material. Um, and students made a range of different interpretations, trying to grapple with the material. Like we developed these categories or with the students after the work was done. And then there was also a performance uh, part of it too. This is like a, just sort of skimming the surface. Um, but the students are um, in per, uh, political performance as it is already. On the right um, was a video that they performed uh, on site where Froebel had been, much to the dismay of the neighbors. And on the other side is students uh, created barriers within the school using the images made into giant paper chains, asking, what might have happened with the barriers that the ninth graders had faced and what would people do now? They asked the question right back to each other. Um, let's see if I can advance this. Um, anyway, so they're amazing folks. Um, many of the people in these pictures who we have go out and presented professional conferences with us um, are in college now. Um, and so, uh, this is sort of the technology where we are, right? A lot of hands-on and analog, but where we want to get is here. This is something um, that I figured out uh, at the workshop. So I met one of the developers who um, made volume, which can read a photo and make it 3D. And so, um, uh, or uh, explained how we could um, take this and I've like uploaded practically a hundred photos. I hope I'm not gonna break their computer. Um, <laughs> but the idea is to um, actually put some of these events back into the sites where they occurred. And so this is the photo we were just looking at. Um, and this is the lunchroom, which I didn't mention my child goes to the school now. I have a kindergartner at the school that was Harrison and is now an elementary school. And so um, the idea is that there would be this object placed in the site where it happened, 
and that students um, who are uh, you know, involved with the teachers and, and the uh, curriculum built around this would be able to um, visit multiple times, encounter the event over time, unlock things like the manifestos that were written. They'd be able to hear some audio or recreations of it. And um, these would be able to um, be planted in schools um, in other parts of the city too. And that's that. Thank you all so much for the great presentations. Um, as a quick reminder, Anne and her team, Village Live, will be hanging out down here during lunch, and so you can come and see a demo of the Village Live app. Um, the others will be around during lunch or and around just so come and grab them if you'd like to talk to them. There'll be also a Q&A in the afternoon where we can have more discussion. So thank you all again, um, and a big round of applause. Um, actually, um, because everyone's been um, so well behaved with time today, we have a little bit of time for Q&A now. We were going to hold it all until the end of the day, but it would actually be great if we could have um, Chien and Laura come up and join us and take a few questions from each other or from the audience before we invite Interference Archive on to present their lunchtime um, activity for us. Would you mind joining us, Laura and Chien? And we'll see if we can dig up some chairs for you as well. Um, thank you all so much, um, this morning's presenters, for framing the discussions of the day from proposing an alternative history of the origins of photography and what it could have been used through Frederick Douglass Chien's extraordinary performance, which was incredibly moving and also showcased both your research and your photography incredibly well, um, as well as the participants in the lab who are, um, it's great to see work in progress. It's great to see um, having seen where you were with your projects when you came in and how your thinking has been opened up um, with the possibilities of these new platforms um, and Village Live as well, which is um, such an incredibly developed um, example of how one can use this medium. So um, I'd like to turn it over to the audience and see if any of you have questions for um, this morning's presenters before we move on. Any questions or comments? Uh, Nicole, I have a question for you. It's me, Alice, in the front. <laughs> Is there a place where we can find um, like lesson plans or curriculum suggestions or anything like that for people who want to do something similar to your work with students? It's a pretty big oh. Sorry. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I, uh, uh, Paulina and I just got um, um, some support from the Propeller Fund to actually publish some of this work. And um, right now we're working on sort of the backlog of some of the um, artwork that the students made. But um, yeah, the idea is, the plan is um, to continue the sort of excavation of the work that we've done for five years. It's amazing how it's piled up so quickly. Um, and then um, get down what we've done in the past. But like the way we move forward is really like emergent like the students pose the questions, which is why we give them the material and then, you know, we grapple with it in a couple different ways. But um, yeah, they're asking the questions. So it's sort of like a, it'll be more like providing a frame and then a history of, as opposed to moving forward. But we should, we should get together and talk about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? Uh, that was Alex Prujansky, who you saw briefly in the video. Um, a great photographer and also one of our lab participants who's doing work that draws on a personal family photograph um, archive of her father's FBI files. Um, he was a member of the Weathermen. So that's another project that we hope to be featuring um, sometime soon. And if you're not on the Magnum Foundation mailing list, please do so, so you can hear about the many events that we do in our office. We often feature the work by our grantees. We had a fantastic talk by uh, Chi Yin just a week or two ago, which was featuring another project that she's working on right now. She's this year's Nobel Peace Prize photographer doing a project on nuclear disarmament, so a totally different 
um, channel of her work. So please do sign up to find out more about our events. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yes. I was struck by some of the kind of relationship between Professor Wexler's um, discussion and the Augmented Histories presentation. And I wanted to just ask um, for, for any of you who just presented about the kind of way in which you're using the present of space and the viewer's relationship to it um, and layering in the kinds of images and past historical narratives, it seems like to transform that experience of space in a particular way, um, perhaps or perhaps not to do what Douglas was maybe thinking of, which is kind of push the viewer towards a different kind of vision of what they're seeing and where they are and the place that they're in. And I mean, and I wondered if there was a way, if this is the kind of thing maybe you might be thinking of and what you may be pushing the viewer of your projects to see. Uh, I can answer that a little bit. So definitely as we started this project um, and started thinking about augmented reality, I think one of the most exciting things about the technology was that it allowed us to kind of recraft the experience of present day New York City. I mean, this city changes so much and so often that sometimes we literally are standing on top of layers of history and the stories that go along with that history. So when I get really excited about augmented reality, it's th I think of it as almost a tool for kind of peeling back those layers so that we can actually kind of move down in space or out in space and start to reveal the stories um, that have built the city into what it is now and kind of create that context around neighborhoods, communities, and even just a particular street corner. Uh, there are so many ways that narratives evolve, and I've seen them actually evolve in a positive way with the way the story of San Antonio is told, but I think it's one really great example that I didn't get a chance to get to in the presentation is, is this quote. Uh, well, first of all, the, the World Heritage Site application, uh, which granted them the, the UNESCO World Heritage status, uh, the missions, it cited the kindness of Spanish colonizers uh, and how, how they showed that towards the local indigenous population, which they didn't enslave them, uh, like a lot of other missions did. Uh, but actually, as one early San Antonio missionary put it, there are some Indians who are hungry and accepting of the faith through the enticement of food. And then there are those who require the king's weapons to convince them of the benefits of civil society. That's the kind of thing that I want people to see. I guess the only thing I'm really thinking about um, in response to your question is that these sites are as you said, site-specific. So uh, augmented reality in a place like New York City may be radically different than augmented reality in, say, Selma, Alabama. So I think in that context, like, we shouldn't be painting with the same wide brush. And, uh, you know, it should be like situation dictates how we apply these uh, new technologies. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think also, and these are just extraordinary projects, so thank you. Um, I think Douglas also wants to think about the future. So it's not only opening up the sealed over scar of the present and looking at what is underneath it and below it and the stories that need to come out and the stories we're unconsciously patterning anyway. Uh, that can be made visible by the uh, augmented realities that you're working with, which are wonderful. But it's also a vision of the future that there, um, as uh, the, the image making capacity of man, and this is Douglas's idea, is that he says humans of all, he says man of all animals is the only picture making animal. And what he means by that is not literally drawing. 
he means the only one that has a conception of a direction to go in the future. And so it seems like implied in your projects is a direction to go in the future. But the ways that you articulated it, it had to do with unburying the past. And so I would, if I'm understanding the question correctly, maybe ask you to think about or to tell us about what you hope for the future about remembering the past. What's it for? As Benjamin says, you know, it's ashes unless we need it for something. So how do these projects enable the picture-making capacity of people for the future is really the question. And I would love to hear what you think about that, if you want to. Well, I think it's a maybe multiple stage process. I think I'm still at the process of excavating what's not there. Um, in a way, it's kind of straightforward in that, you know, there's a lot, the this period of history and I think a lot of Cold War or early Cold War histories still haven't been fully written. And the versions that we have right now are mainly told by the, the winners and the colonial masters. So I'm just trying to fill in a lot of gaps in that history. Um, in Asia specifically, I think um, because the powers that are in place now kind of just receive the mantle of power from the colonial masters. So I think that political histories, the political situations today have direct links to what came before. And there's a kind of state-imposed state amnesia about some of the histories that are from the wrong side. So I'm just trying to kind of rebalance that for the moment. And I think it does impact the contemporary and the future in a very direct way if we don't kind of get these skeletons out of our closets. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Oh, okay. Um, hi. Uh, at first, I just want to say thank you. I mean, I just feel like I've, I, you've opened up a whole new conversation for me today, and um, I just want to congratulate you all for your work. Um, I'm wondering to what extent, and I know that a lot of these projects are new or at the beginning stages, but where do you see, um, especially in the technology, linking to other similar kinds of, you know, recontextualizing uh, archives? Um, I'm specifically also thinking about the Village Project, which... I'm not sure to what extent you deal with AIDS and the history of that, you know, huge event in the 80s in the village. And the, the um, ACT UP Oral History Project also exists with a huge, you know, volume of... I'm just wondering, and that just to me is the most obvious intersection, but I know that there are many, so... Or, and also user input. When, where, and when can people add to your archives? And that's it. Well, I, I, I think that because these technologies are so young, that there's like a lot of opportunity for you know like user generated content, like you mentioned. Um, but it's just one additional tool to the history of storytelling and archiving. And so I, I'm not sure that it really resolves, um, you know, or is a solution to, uh, you know, creating the seminal alternative history. But I do think it's part of, um, you know, this trend. And I think um, it was mentioned earlier that this technology is like uniquely positioned um, to really respond in live time um, to our ideologies. So I guess that's my two cents. Uh, when you're done. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's potential when you open it up to too many people. You can have a, just this influx of material that's too hard to sift through. But at the same time, I think it's worth, uh, even if you don't have time to verify everything, to, to make some space for imagined histories and, and hear them out and, and at least make sure that, that you can, can refer back to them and, and hear from a lot of different perspectives. 
Yeah, so with Village Life, we've actually spent the last year um, speaking to a number of other archives around the city, trying to figure out um, how we can incorporate more archives into this particular story and tell this story from more than one voice, right? Because there's a lot of sides to it. Um, what's really happened as we've met with these organizations is that we've realized, you know, these might not fit into our story, but there are stories that need to be told, which is where History Live has started emerging, is thinking about, can we use this framework and tell different stories? One of the things we've been working on from the user experience side for all of uh, for Village Live and any projects we put forward in the future is uh, crafting an experience that allows users to contribute to the story. Um, in particular, this is a big ambitious ambition for Village Life because, again, there's just so many people in that neighborhood even still who have so much to contribute to this larger story. Um, it's just a bit of a challenge from a technical side or from a design side more than technical because we want to refine the experience enough that the stories which are con contributed are directly relevant to the narrative. Um, so we've been holding back on that functionality, although we've done an, a lot of user testing around it, because we don't want the story kind of veering off course. Um, so I think th that would be, like that is a big goal of ours. We think it would be a great contribution to the story that we're telling. And so it's really just kind of narrowing in on how to frame that properly. That's where we're at. Right. So there is a lot of footage in his archive, uh, but most of it is in the older years is visiting home. So another challenge is just in the archives we're working with, finding archives that um, fit the model. So you know, how do you put a piece of footage in the middle of the street or on the sidewalk? It needs to be in that location. It needs to, you know, be framed a certain way. It needs to not be shaky. They need to be standing in one location. So there's just like a lot of sorting through. But yeah, it's a really important part of the story and we want to find room for it in, in the experience. Thank you so much for making time to answer some of those questions. And we'll have, again, more time at the end of the day. But now I actually wanted to turn it over to um, our next guests, who are Interference Archive, um, who are going to be telling you a little bit about their organization and then also have prepared a presentation that will be on view up here on the stage during our lunch break, and we welcome you to come down to the stage after they've spoken and actually look at the material that they've laid out for you. And we'll also have Village Live um, on display, so you can actually take a look at it and experience it yourself, um, which is really extraordinary. So thank you all so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Um, the Interference Archive, um, I'm, I'm proud to say that one of the members of the Interference Archive is Ryan Buckley, who is also the Magnum Foundation's archivist. Um, do we have Ryan and Nora in the room somewhere? They're probably yeah, desperately laying out tables of materials, but we'll pull them away from that for a moment. The Interference Archive explores the relationship between cultural production and social movements. It's an OpenStax archival collection, so that's an archive that favors use over preservation, which I think is an amazing um, and radical idea of how an archive can operate, as well as a center that encourages critical and creative engagement with the history of social movements through its programs, um, which are both around the city in collaboration like today's, but also at their new home in Brooklyn, so check that out. Um, it's a collectively run, all-volunteer organization. I mem mentioned that one of its members is Ryan Buckley, who is the Magnum Foundation archivist, um, and he's joined by his colleague, Nora Almeida. Um, Ryan and Nora will introduce the work of the Interference Archive, and then again, once they break, we invite you to come down to the stage and look through the materials that they've put together, um, which are a collection of zines, posters, and other materials. Um, and then we'll break for lunch, and we'll meet back here at one o'clock. And our first speaker when we come back is Nick Mirzoff. Um, so Ryan and Nora, thank you very much. Thanks so much for inviting us.
Okay, so um, welcome, thank you. Uh, we're from Interference Archive, I'm Nora and this is Ryan. Um, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about the space and some of the work we do and building off that introduction um, before we bring out some materials and this will be brief because I know we're leading up to lunch here. Um, but we're located in, uh, we have a new space we've been in since October in Park Slope um, on 7th Street in Brooklyn. Um, and you can come visit us. We're open on Thursdays through Sundays. You can just drop in and use the, the material in our archive. Um, as was mentioned in the intro, our mission is to explore the relationship between cultural production and social movements, and that kind of guides the types of material we collect. Um, so we really collect things that are not traditionally things that you would find in an archive and that they are mostly outward facing materials. So things that were produced in multiples by activists as part of social movements and community organizing. So instead of collecting like papers or one of a kind materials, we have a lot of things that were created for mass distribution, although a lot of those things um, are ephemeral and would have probably not been preserved otherwise. And so kind of aggregating them in one place um, and co-locating them. So we organize our collections by four Format. So you can find things from, you know, one um, social movement next to another social movement that span history and, and geographic locations. And so this really facilitates browsing across issue and topic in terms of how things are organized. And some of the kinds of things that we have are posters, pamphlets. Um, we have a bunch of comics and zines. We have some zines with us to show today. Um, buttons. Uh, periodicals. Uh, we have a lot of alternative newspapers in particular, especially from like the 70s and 80s in New York. Um, we collect uh, more other kinds of graphic material, t-shirts, video, um, audio collections. Um, we have a bunch of records and we also have a book library that you can come and use um, in this space. And so one of the things that we really try to do is make uh, connections not only between different social movements represented by our collection, but also between the materials that we house in the archive and ongoing social struggles. Um, and so some of the ways that we do that are through our free public programs, um, exhibitions, and we also create a lot of publications, usually in, in coordination with some of the exhibits that we put on. Um, and this really allows people who are not really a familiar with archival research a way into our collections because that's often a barrier. People kind of have an idea about how to use archives and we're trying to break down some of those conceptions. Um, so uh, in terms of how we're different from a traditional archive, I mentioned how some of our materials are a little bit different, but a lot of times I think when people think about an archive, um, and I'm a librarian, so like this is certainly how I have thought about archives before I got involved <laughs> um, at Interference, but you think about old, fragile things in a dark basement <laughs> somewhere. Um, we often think about municipal spaces, um, which are public, but they're is often this kind of barrier to getting access to those materials. There's a lot of regulations or rules about how to handle things. Um, we often are taught like that archives have to do with history, and so there's this assumption that they're sort of apolitical or comprehensive in some way. Um, there, and also, like a lot of people think about archives as sort of politically neutral spaces um, and highly regulated. So. One of the things that we're trying to do is address the baggage that this baggage that archives carry with them and, the, and um, cultural expectations that can work to silence alternative voices and you know, uh, narratives that wouldn't otherwise be heard. All right, so our approach is to, to look at the material that we have and to work as to what it wants. So uh, we're an archive of radical material. We're also a radical archive. Um, we want to reconsider what the role of the archive is in a community space and to use the material to kind of create a dialogue with the community. Um, can I give you this to yeah. switch? So we are all volunteer run, non-hierarchical, anti-capitalist. We want to create a structure for the material that doesn't impose on it the same sort of order and oppression that it is created to try to uh, counter. So we're all volunteer run, is supported by people who are just donating. Um, we have working groups rather than like a president or a director. We have a spokes council, which each member sits on different working groups and that allows us to communicate amongst each other. Um, oh yeah, we don't have, there's a great video here of Vero, one of our uh, volunteers who 
isn't going to be streamed through this <laughs> particular <laughs> slide. During, yes. During later. So um, we have some videos that will be playing later. <laughs> but she's essentially talking about the, the aspect of letting people really handle the objects. Um, they were produced to be publicly distributed, so to prohibit a hands-on engagement with them is um, not really allowing the objects to speak for themselves and for their purpose. So we let people come in and, and handle things. We highly encourage people to open boxes and explore and walk through the stacks. And uh, another way we do that is through inviting the community in for certain things. So we do cataloging parties um, as a way to sort of train and empower and, and invite multiple perspectives into how we describe the material. So it's not just a few um, people based on seniority or educational prestige who are determining how something is described. We're, we're really opening that up to people. Um, and doing that allows us to kind of, you know, bridge that, that boundary between who describes the material and who uses it. Uh, so in very much we, we want to focus ourselves as a community center, a social center, and a library that people can just come in and use. Uh, to create a space where dialogue can happen around these materials and where people feel welcome to, to come in and, and do that. And most of that is focused around use as preservation. So the materials, if you're not using them, they're, they're not really serving their purpose. So we don't want them to come and die in the archive. We want it to, to enliven people. Um, so we also take the material out of the archive and we bring it to people. So if there are public events, uh, we've been doing like the Red Hook Scene Fest, the Anarchist Book Fair, uh, Anti-Gentrification Summit. Uh, there's a reading room at the end of this month at a social justice camp upstate. So we want to make the archive something that is beyond the walls. And I think this is a way that we're allowing ourselves to do that. And you want to take over on collabs? Sure. So just a couple of words about some of the collaborations that we've done. Obviously, today is one. Um, <laughs> but we've uh, collaborated with a bunch of different groups in the city. Um, we've done events with uh, Mobile Print Power, which is a multi-generational uh, Latino printmaking collective based in Queens, with Combat Paper, which is a veterans organization um, that turns your old military uniform into paper um, that you can make a book on. Um, we've done work with the Willie May Rock Camp for Girls. We're doing um, an upcoming event with the next Epoch Seed Library. Um, we've done um, work with local collectors who have given us things to put in uh, exhibits. Um, we've done some work with prison activists. So these are just a few things. We also have a podcast, if you're interested in checking that out, and where we interview a lot of people in the city and beyond. We've done episodes about the Closed Rikers campaign. There's a recent interview with some people from Bread and Puppet. We've done a bunch of events, and there's an interview on the podcast up with uh, Radio Free Gowanus. Um, and one of the things that I've been really involved in and in kind of making this connection between the past and the, and the present and kind of trying to get some of the ideas represented in the archival collections out in a broader space are um, doing Wikipedia edit-a-thons. So we've done a bunch of these. We just did one in March on art and feminism. Um, we're actually doing one on Saturday on feminist urbanism. There's a discussion group tomorrow with a scholar from the new school. Um, and then we're gonna, Saturday, we're gonna work collectively on an article um, and we We've done a few of those. And then um, lastly, uh, you know, we've done a lot of um, work just having conversations and creating materials for contemporary st struggles. So that really leads into what we're going to do now, which is disseminate some materials um, as for use this afternoon at the May Day rally um, or wherever your next <laughs> organizing <laughs> moves take you. Um, so yes, uh, we're gonna have a propaganda party now. We had some material that we produced on Sunday at an exhibition opening we just had. Um, what we mean by propaganda party is coming from the word propagate, uh, but we want to you know, use the word and not a negative connotation. So um, it was Chomsky who said like, uh, propaganda is to democracy but violence is to a dictatorship. So if we can take propaganda and use it as a way to fight against that part of the system to counter the barrage of images that control us in a certain way, we can maybe have an effect. So um, we are 
Gonna bring some posters out. Um, we're gonna make some buttons. Um, we would be silk screening on site if uh, we could, but there's been some shift of rooms, so uh, we're limited to the stage. But come down and uh, take some posters. Some of the material is Mayday related, and there's a march after the event here today um, in Union Square. So grab some things if you wanna come join us, put some buttons on, and yeah, enjoy. Thanks.